Morning, everybody. How are you all doing today? Good. I need a volunteer. And if not, it's OK. We'll make it work. But is anybody willing to come down and play piano for me? Uh, Pixie couldn't do it. Anybody? Yeah. That'd be great. So what we're going to do again today is uh, uh, we're going to turn into the, the church choir. And we're going to sing our way through a few hymns this morning. So we will uh, sing the verse of a song, and then we'll talk about the message of the verse and work our way down through it. Because uh, what I think that we have here in, uh, in the hymnal is a wonderful collection of Christian poetry that's designed to help us in our Christian experience. It's designed to teach us and to draw us closer to God in, in many different ways. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to take uh, two of my favorite hymns, and we're, we will work our way down through them. So we'll sing a verse, we'll talk about the verse, and think about this a little bit as, as Sabbath school, because I'll ask you some questions, and uh, you know, don't feel too bad. Just tell me what you think, and we'll work our way down through the songs that we have. So I'll pray, and we'll get started, and then our, our first song will be, I'll, I'll let you know after we pray. Heavenly Father, yeah, <laughs> Heavenly Father, as we get started this morning, uh, we ask that you be with us, and in all things, in all ways together, that we would draw closer to you. And we say this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first song this morning that we're going to sing as church choir is 465. So we'll, again, we'll sing one verse together, and then we'll talk about it, and then we'll sing the next verse. You can give us a lead in, and then we'll sing the uh, 465. to or hidden in the different lines. So taking a look just at the first line of 465, what verse comes to mind when we think of, I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest. Is there anything that comes to mind? That's what comes to mind when I think about it. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is e easy and my burden is light. And uh, looking at the second line, <clears throat> lay down, thou weary one, lay down thy head upon my breast. That kind of make that, in my mind, that makes me think of the Last Supper when Jesus is with the disciples. And uh, John the Baptist is reclining against Jesus as they're eating. Jesus wants that close relationship with us. And at least, you know, thinking about the, the passage in Matthew, come to me, all you who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lonely heart. And number 465 for those that are just coming in. The idea of this passage in Matthew is that whatever God asks us to carry in this life, it's preferable to carrying whatever burdens that we have without his help by ourselves. God wants to be with us in this life, making things easier for us. And we will develop that more in the next verse. So let's sing the second verse, if you would.
reminds you of, or that, that makes you think of? The woman at the well? Does anyone have any other thoughts also? That's certainly one of the things I thought of. <clears throat> yeah, I think the woman at the well uh, was kind of the main thing that I was thinking of. And then also, uh, let's see here. I came to Jesus and I drank of that life-giving stream. My thirst was quenched, my soul revived. And that kind of made me think a little bit of Psalm 23, where Jesus leads us, behind, leads us beside still, still pools of water and makes sure that we're able to get what we need in a, in a way that we can actually take. So what function does the living water play for us? When Jesus is speaking to the woman at the well, she's trying to satisfy her desires in life, trying to find something or someone, in her case, that will plug the hole, the deep hole of her, of her, her own longing. And so this soul desire is what Jesus offers us, the fundamental desire for peace and connection with God through the Holy Spirit. And in thinking about this, this reminded me, this connection, this reminded me of, um, I was on Reddit recently, uh, a forum on the internet, and I was reading uh, in the, in the Ask Reddit area where people post questions and then people respond with their personal experiences. And someone had posted a question to the community. Uh, for those of you who uh, weren't believers and then became believers, what was it that caused that transition? And people were sharing different experiences. Uh, it, <laughs> uh, just one is an example that, that, that caught my mind, although this isn't necessarily super important for the, the message, but. This one person was just just going over the, the meaningless of, of life and and ultimately like how can we know that there's a higher power and he went to the the, the vending machine to get a, a a candy bar and all that was left was Snickers which I wasn't really particularly excited about so he got himself a Snicker but it ended up being the candy bar that he really wanted wrapped as a Snicker and that was his divine moment <laughs> like I'm to believe it's, it's interesting to me that you know God can reach us in all kinds of different ways. But where I really want to go with is this, is that the comments after people's discussion about how they came to faith, one of the comments that I saw over and over again was, well, I wish I could be a believer because there's, a, there's, a, there's an assurance and a peace that believers have that I don't have in my life. And uh, a friend of mine shared with me a website uh, um, uh, uh, in, the, in the past where um, someone had interviewed Adventists who were no longer Believers, and one of the things that popped up again in their comments was, you know, part of me wishes I still could believe because it's very comforting to know that God is looking out for me. And this is what God offers us with this living water. Come to me, and I will give you the living water. God takes care of our, our soul desire. And in a sense, God answers the big questions of life for us. And then we get to move forward with the big questions answered with God helping us to answer the smaller questions as opposed to having an idea about the smaller questions in life, but the big questions in life are unanswered. Let's sing the third verse of number 465. dark world's like light look unto me thy morn shall rise and all thy day be bright and on is that are there any passages that come to mind where does a light into my path and a lamp into my feet anyone else John 1 5 what does that say uh, I am the light that comes into 
world? Yeah, John 1, 5, I am the light of the world, absolutely. And uh, what came to mind for me was um, John 8, 12, where Jesus had just uh, dwelt with the, um, the woman who had been caught in adultery. And then he says to his disciples right afterwards, and again, and again Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk, walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So, and then I also, just think about it now, um, when Jesus came into the world, there was a, a bright and shining star that let everyone know that he was there and that he would be the, the light of the world. And certainly Jesus being the light uh, is one of the main themes of the, the book of John. So now let's transition to our second song this morning. We're going to do two songs, sing our way through two songs. Uh, and let's sing number 280. Now, 280, I think, in my opinion, presents the gospel in the clearest way of the, the hymns, at least, that I am aware of. <clears throat> Just breaks it down. What we need to know in order to be saved, the mindset that we need to have, and the relationship with God that we need to have. So, number 280, Come Ye Sinners. Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes. Now let's see here. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Because our first step, you know, I, I, th uh, I think Alcohol is Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous or whatever, it's kind of built, built off the same principle because when you reach the point where you sort of accept who you are, this is me, this is my problem, I don't really have anything in myself to be able to fix this problem. I need to get help from outside of myself. That's the point when you can begin to get help and to change. Because before, without the, with, without the sense of the need to change, you're not going to change. <clears throat> and let's see. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. And that line there makes me think of the parable of the, the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan is a, a story of compassion where bigotry prevented people who should have been able to help from helping. And it was someone who was unexpected, a stranger, someone who is more of a, a supposed enemy than anything else, who stopped by, helped the man at his own expense, and then said, if there's anything else that's needed, I'll take the cost of it. And at the end of that parable, Jesus says, this is really how you should act. But there's a deeper meaning behind this parable, uh, Christ's Object Lessons brings out, where this is a story about God's relationship to the world, where God is, you could say, coming through the universe, and he sees this broken world that's been attacked, and he says, man, these people really need help, but it's going to cost me a lot to do that. And Jesus counted the cost, and it was worth it to him to step down and to be able to be the one to provide us the help that we need so that we could be made whole again and, and, and restored. <clears throat> it wasn't something he did likely, but we were worth it enough for him that he was willing to be able to do it. Full of pity, love, and power. Let's sing verse 2.
thirsty, come and welcome, God's free bounty glorify. And again, the, the scripture that came to my mind when looking through this passage was sort of staying in the Beatitudes, right? So the fourth Beatitude is, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And the progression of the, the mind that we have here in the Beatitudes of coming to God we need to reach the point where it's something that we want. Come ye thirsty, come and welcome. God's free bounty or treasure, give thanks for it. True belief and true repentance, every grace that brings you nigh. I was thinking of the, also when Jesus, it was the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, Jesus' brothers had asked them if he was gonna travel with them up to the feast. And he says, I'm not going up just yet. But he does go up uh, after they go up and goes in quietly and then starts teaching. And then after a few days towards the end of the festival, you know, it's such a shame because you, what you had was a true system of worship that had the life sucked out of it such that it really didn't represent true worship anymore. And so Jesus sees the people that are caught up in a dry round of ceremony and pomp and circumstance and are really not being satisfied. And he stands up and he says, I'm the light of the world. <clears throat> Actually, I think it was living water. Let's just turn there real quick. I think it's John 6. I just want to make sure I say it right. This is what happens when I write, don't write down my verses. <clears throat> I'm not really finding what I'm looking for. But anyhow, it was a powerful moment. Jesus stands up and says, I'm what everybody needs. And uh, yeah, shame, I'll write that down next time. John 7, John 7. all right. Feast of booze, all right. What's the verse I'm looking for? Uh, let's see here. 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not yet been given. So again, we sort of come back to what the last song was talking about, the living water that Jesus offers to give us. And uh, it's the effect of the spirit living in our lives to satisfy our, our deep soul desire of God working in us. So let's sing the third verse here. Number 280. Let not conscience make fitness fondly dream. Now, this is kind of curious because isn't conscience a good thing? It can be sometimes. Hmm? I say it's a blessing thing. Yeah, it's a blessing when our, our conscience is rightly educated because some people's conscience has just been corrupted by living in this world. The Bible refers to it as an evil conscience. And so it needs to be educated. But what this verse is talking about is just saying, you know, I think it's speaking about it in a good sense. The person says, you know, I've done wrong, but what happens is that sense of wrongness is keep preventing that person from coming to God. And so the desire is to, well, let me just stop doing X, Y, and Z, or let me fix things first, and then I'll come to God, and then it'll be okay. That's not really how it works. I mean, because 
<laughs> if we're sick, we need to go to the doctor in order to get the cure. And this is what Jesus is offering us. He says, look, this is the situation. This is the problem. And rather than trying to fix it on your own, come to me and I have the solution that will take care of your problem, the heart's desire, the, the separation from God that we have. All right, let's sing the fourth, fourth verse. <clears throat> me think of a passage in Hebrews. It's taken the long moment to freeze up on me here. All right, Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Lo, the incarnate God, the God who has come down and who has become human, the one who knows what it's like to suffer and to be tempted, the one who is poor, hard family, family troubles, his brothers gave him grief all the time, was from a disrespected ethnic group, the Romans looked down on him. You know, every disadvantage that you can have in life, Jesus went through it. Jesus can relate to all the struggles that we have, and so he stands before God representing us. He is able to help us. He pleads the merit of his, of his blood. So the call then of this song is, venture on him, venture wholly, let no other trust intrude. Because at the brass tacks, we can trust him when it comes down to it. He has been here. He has lived as us. He is working for us. It is his highest goal. Let no other trust intrude. So I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms. In the arms of my dear Savior, oh, there are 10,000 charms. And so as we, you know, the hymnal is a devotional tool that we can use. We can take it, we can sing, we can think about the words, and as we go through, let's look for the scriptural allusions and then look for the calls and look for the ways that God is drawing closer, us closer to him. And the message from this one and the one that we did previously, I will arise and go to Jesus. May it be our heart's desire. Let's pray and I'll let you out a little early. Heavenly Father, uh, again, we want to thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together as a congregation. And may all the things that we do here uh, be such that it would draw us closer to you and uh, be a benefit to anyone else who might be here joining us today. And we say this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we have different uh, uh, Bible study classes. We have one here in the main sanctuary. There's one behind, I think, those windows, one behind those windows. One down the hall in the library, and the young adults will be down the hall in the fellowship room.
Well, good morning and happy Sabbath. I trust everybody had a wonderful week. Any blessings anybody wants to share this morning? Yes. Eloise? One of my friends was in the ICU for over three weeks and was able to go home oh. yesterday. Amen. Amen. All right, Brazil has been hit very hard with COVID. Amen. Yes. So, Paul, if you haven't heard the presentation last night on the judgment, we need to hear it. All right. Did you have? No? It's all. I don't want to get the best news we've got. That's the new name for one. Oh. The judgment is the best news we have. All right. Well, let's bow our heads and we will get started. Almighty Father. It is good to be in your house this morning. Spring is here, the birds are chirping, the flowers are up. Um, it reminds me of new life, new beginnings. And I am thankful, I am very thankful for it. As we open the lesson this morning, it's an important lesson and I ask that you will uh, be with us, help us to understand it, give us insight, maybe new insight, and guide us into a closer relationship with you, because that's what it's all about. We love you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> all right. Now, typically, I start with uh, things that are going on in the world. I'm going to save that to the end. If we have time, we can do that. There's plagues of mice in Australia. They say they go out at night. It looks like the ground is moving. Um, there's, uh, they're using uh, the vaccine passport in New York, as well as other countries. It's not as big a deal for the vaccine, but it is a platform that anything else can be bolted onto, and it is quite um, disturbing in how it may affect our, our freedoms. But anyway, all those things are happening. But the lesson this morning isn't going to make complete sense unless we get to the very end. And usually I run out of time, so we are going to get right into the lesson. And if we have time, we'll cover those things um, because they are interesting as well. The lesson this morning is the covenant primer. What is primer? Manual. Primer lesson. Manual. Manual, beginner. Um, the primary information. Primary information, okay, I heard. Foundation, all right. So what is the definition of a covenant? Let's start at the beginning. What's the definition of a covenant? An agreement. An agreement. Okay. An agreement based on some conditions. Okay. Um, there's privileges, there's responsibilities, all part of an agreement. Any attorneys in the house want to give a better definition of a covenant? No, I agree. It's a two-way agreement where <laughs> each party has an obligation and a right. <laughs> See, there you go. Couldn't have said it better. Each party has an obligation and a right. So if I were to purchase land, there is a covenant or contract or agreement. Uh, we both have responsibilities. Um, they are to provide some asset, the land. I am to provide money. Um, when that transaction takes place, what happens to that contract or that covenant? Can't hear you guys. It's ratified. Well, it's ratified. It's done. OK. 
Okay. Okay. We're gonna we're gonna get there eventually, um, but in the lesson and definitions I was looking up, they describe in the Bible two basic types of covenants or agreements. One is between equals, mutual covenant, mutual agreement. Okay, um, and that's what I describe like purchasing land. The other covenant or agreement or contract is between, described as lord and vassal, or between inferior, or I'm sorry, superior and inferior. Totally different types of covenants. Um, look at, real quick, we're going to be opening the Bible a lot this morning, Isaiah chapter 36, verses 15 and 16. Isaiah chapter 36. Verses 15 through and 16. So this is Hezekiah. Sennacherib has surrounded the city. And here it says, Nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of, king, of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, Make peace with me by a present, and come out to me, and every one of you from his own vine, and every one from his own fig tree and everyone from his will drink of his own waters and his own cistern and I will come and take you away to a land. Sennacherib wanted to make a covenant with Hezekiah. What type of covenant was this? He was the superior, Hezekiah was the inferior. He was coming to conquer the city. Okay? So when we talk about the, I'm going to use the term everlasting covenant, what kind of covenant is that? Kind of a trick question. Perfect. Perfect covenant? Okay. Hey, Ron. Yes. It's interesting in the New Testament, uh, the authors of the New Testament, when they use the word that's translated covenant, it's actually the Greek word diatheke. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. But that conveys the idea of a will as opposed to a contract in which there are two parties that have responsibilities okay. and obligations and so on. It's a will is a completely different thing than a contract. And so the, the word that's translated in the New Testament, covenant, is actually more uh, along the lines of a will than a contract. So Rob is saying the word, I thought it was diatheke, but I have no idea. I don't speak Greek. Um, the um, Hebrew word is bereth. Um, he says it's more of a will or a last will and testament or instead of a contract where both parties agree. We're going to look at that. I actually believe there's a third type of covenant agreement. Not necessarily brought out in the lesson, but I wanted to bring it out because I think it's very applicable and that's what we're talking about here. It is a marriage covenant. Think about the marriage covenant or contract. I went back and actually looked up the vows that I took. And I'm going to quote it to you. It says, I take thee faith to be my wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward for better or for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and cherish till death do us part. I pledge thee my faith. Now her vow was just one word different. Now many of you are not going to like it, but I'll just share it. For richer, for poorer, for sickness and health, to love and to cherish and obey Till death do us part, I pledge thee my oath, my faith. How does this covenant differ from the other two I described? Based on what? I don't, I don't see any reciprocal responsibility. Okay. This is, this is something you take on regardless of the response of your wife. All right. Something I take on regardless of the response of my wife. Now, my wife could have said no, right? So she always has that option to say no. I do not want to enter this covenant. What is my responsibility as husband? Be faithful. Be faithful. Okay, very important. Honor your wife. 
Honor my wife. Well, there, there was a whole list there, Ron. There was. <laughs> there was a whole list. And some of them are hard, hard to do on a consistent basis. So. Take care of her. Cherish her. Have you, I mean, it's no surprise that God equates our relationship with him as a marriage. It's equivalent to a marriage covenant. It's based on mutual love and respect. You were going to say something, Joe? I think the highest caliber that Christ offers us in this parallel is he says he encourages us as husbands to love our wives as Christ loved the church, but then he concludes that by saying, and gave himself for it. That in a marriage relationship is the rarest of rare relationship that you ever seen, where a husband truly gives himself for his spouse. In the perfect marriage relationship, that is what it's supposed to be. Okay? Now, <laughs> I'm not even going to repeat that. <laughs> The Bible mentions a number of covenants. You have Old Covenant, New Covenant, the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with Noah. And that's what our lesson is about this morning, going through all those covenants. What I am going to tell you this morning, this is Ron, that I believe there has always been and ever will be one covenant. It is the one and same covenant, which is why it has the title Everlasting Covenant. God says, covenant will be, I will be your God and you will be my people. Now there's a, implications in there. If you accept me, Jehovah is your God, you will be my special people forever. And let me add a few more words. If you accept me as Jehovah your God to worship, honor, and obey, that's kind of implied as God, then you will be my special people forever, and I will come and save you if needed. Now, when did God establish this covenant? Before the foundation of the world. I'm sorry? Before anything was made. Before anything was made. Before the foundation of the world. All right. I'm glad you guys got that. Because... Think, if God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? He does not change. God is love, right? It's not he is loving, he is love. When the Father and the Son came together and they said, let us create man in our image, what was implied right there and then? Let us create man in our image, what's implied? Okay, that we would reflect Christ. What else? A fellowship between God and man. Okay, there would be fellowship between God and man. He, he was creating us to dwell in us. I'm going to get to that. Cindy? John Gibson talks about how their image is actually a threefold um, unit, like family unit of other-centered, self-sacrificing love. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. I believe that as the creator, we are the created. As the creator, by saying, let us make man in our image, God was right there making the decision. 
father and son were making a decision that they were going to enter a covenant with man forever. They were going to love, cherish, take care of, and if necessary, save us. How else could you describe a being who is love? Think about the, think about the opposite. If man sinned, well, the other option is, well, too bad, let them go. God is love. He could not do that. So by making the decision to create, he entered the, a covenant with us, which is more of a, as Rob was saying, more of a one-sided will than a mutual agreement. Now, let's get to, well, let me just read this real quick. God created man a superior being. He alone is formed in the image of God and is capable of partaking of the divine nature of cooperating with his creator and executing his plans. So man was an entirely new creature in all the universe. We were to have God dwelling in us. Okay? God is love. There's no force. We had to willingly agree, reciprocate, what was the tree of knowledge of good and evil? What did, was the tree of knowledge of good and evil in relation to this covenant? Okay. Well, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, how long was it going to be there? Have you guys ever read this? Long time. Not forever. Until the test was completed. Until the test was completed. Roughly, we were told, about 6,000 years. What is this test that was going to be completed? To prove their loyalty. All right, they were going to reciprocate in this covenant relationship, okay? So now this, this plan of salvation from the foundation of the world makes sense. It had to be. If God is a social being and he created us to dwell in us, the plan of salvation had to be from the foundation of the world because God being love by the virtue of creating us was entering a covenant with us to take care of us and ultimately save us if needed. You were going to say something. You know, last night I was reading after I listened to that one and, and I believe last night. He gave us a text and the fellow that has a theory, the, the uh, evangelism right now. It's in Ezekiel. Okay. What does that really tell you? How much? How much he loves us. Much love. I mean, mercy, love. He tried it 4,000 years ago to, to, to do something. It didn't work. So then he says, well, I'll do this. I'll send my son down. And what did they do to the, his son? Nail him to the cross. Mm -hmm. We're 2,000 years. We should be. It's all about the relationship. So this tree was a test. Did we want to accept this covenant that God was offering? <clears throat> Eve chose Lucifer as her God. Adam chose Eve. Both were a substitute for God. And so they, in essence, said, no, I don't want this covenant. Now, did God end there? Okay. 
Now, I, we're not going to go into the book of Hosea, but the whole book of Hosea is basically telling us this story. God tells Hosea, go find a prostitute, go home, he marries her, she has a son, she run, runs away, she goes out and is still a prostitute, he goes and gets her and brings her back. This is the story of God's people down through time. This is the covenant relationship story of Hosea and Gomer is a parallel to us. We're constantly going out and leaving God. Okay? Let's go to Genesis 6.18 real quick. Genesis chapter 6, verse 18. Find it, go ahead and read it. I'm slow. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, your sons' wives with you. All right. I will establish my covenant with you. You will go into the ark, you basically, and your family. Is this a new covenant? A different covenant? A separate covenant? God, God and Noah. You obey me, you build an ark, go into the ark, I will save you. Or is this an extension of the same covenant? Extension. New covenant? Extension. extension of the original covenant? Okay. Remember, God had promised that he would save us if we needed. Now, there was probably a billion plus people on earth. Eight people were saved. All right, so that's an extension of that covenant. How about Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3? Flip over. Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your kindred and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And then go to chapter 17 real quick. The first seven verses there. I won't read them all. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Verse 4, my covenant is with you. You shall be a father of many nations. Verse 7, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants. So now here we have the Abrahamic covenant. Is this a new covenant, or is this an extension of the Garden of Eden? There's two words that are very important here. Two words. Okay. I will. Okay. He did it in the beginning in the Garden of Eden. He did it with Noah. Now he's doing it with Abraham. Okay. I It is. There's nothing that has changed. We're going we're gonna to end there. God said, I will. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Anything that is, is, is this differentiates the new covenant, different covenant, the next, you know, let's say dispensational. Okay. That every time God moves it in a different way, he gives a different covenant. We, but we believe it's all one covenant all the time. All right. So if you didn't hear that, he said, if you believe in different covenants, one, two, three, four, whatever it is, it's dispensationalism. It's God's working differently in different periods of time. God is working, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We started that. And you were going to have a comment?
So he's saying the only difference is who God has established. I will, as he said, establish my covenant with you. And it's who. So with Abraham, he said, I will bless you as a people. I will give you the land of Canaan for a possession. Um, to make no, I will make known my will to you. I will send you the Messiah. And I will make you my chosen instrument for the conversion of the world. All right. So let's now go on to Exodus chapter 6. Ron? Yes. On this one, you read the first eight verses, and I don't see any responsibilities on Abraham's part. God just says, I will do this. Well, almost. He called Abraham out of Ur. Yeah. Not in those specific first, verses, the but yes. Seven, the first eight verses of chapter 17. He did call and Abraham did follow, but then when God said, this is my covenant, it was, it was a one-sided thing. So, well, let me, let's dwell on this just a minute before we get to Exodus. He said it's a one-sided thing. Did Adam and Eve have an obligation? Yes. Not to eat of the tree. Pretty simple. All right. Did Noah have an obligation? Yep. Yep. Build an ark. Noah could have said no, like the other billion people. Build the ark, get in the ark. Did Abraham have an obligation? He had to go. All these are based on, remember, a marriage relate. This is based on a love, reciprocal love relationship. They were responding in love. God first loved us. All right, I'm, I'm going to keep moving. Exodus chapter six, verses one through eight. Um, now we're here at Moses. Then the Lord said to Moses, "Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh." Well. All right, so they're coming out of Egypt. Let's go to chapter 19, verses, start with verse 5. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all your people, for all the earth is mine. You shall be a kingdom of priests, and it goes on. So here you have Abraham who's been up on the mount, spoke with God, comes back with the Ten Commandments, and he says, Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, what covenant is he talking about here? Same one. Same one. All right. I'm really making this point. I'm driving it home. All right. Same covenant. What is their obligation? Obey. To obey. Now, we, go ahead, Nancy. I mean that the obligation has to be clear and provided to them. You are in our time, the same amount of territory. If it's your time, it's supposed to be you. Yes. So it's not what you do, what yes. you do, that's what you do. So Abraham, even though in chapter 17, God was not helping do this or that, Abraham had the choice to believe. Yes. So Denise is saying, it's not a matter of specifically what we do, it's a matter of do we believe? Do we believe that our, if you will, spouse is going to take care of us like he promised? Can I put it that way? I mean, that is, it's a marriage covenant relationship. You were going to say, Debbie? And, and this is a little bit of semantics, but the word obey sounds more onerous than to get willingly have fidelity to the relationship. Okay. Rob, and actually along the lines of what Debbie was saying there, the, the words obey and keep in use, used in this text here that we just read are actually better translated listen and cherish. The Hebrew words there are actually listen to my, uh, listen to my voice and cherish my covenant. All right. And that puts a whole new tenor Perfect. on yeah. the verse. I don't even have to go to the next part of my notes. <laughs> Listen and cherish. Remember this marriage relationship. 
God, remember, we were created for him to dwell in us. It's that relationship, okay? Listen and cherish. So obey. Um, we have missed the mark on this to a great extent. We must obey the law or, you know, we get rejected. This is a love relationship. We're responding. Go, all right, let's keep moving. Exodus chapter 24, verse 7. Says, then Moses, Moses here, then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. All right, what is the book of the covenant? I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. The law. The law, okay. Go to Deuteronomy 4.13. Four thirteen. Go ahead and read it if you got it. For he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, that is, the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. All right. So the covenant here is just wanted to make sure we understand the laws. Lindell said the Ten Commandments he wrote on the two tables of stone. This is how we respond if we want to accept this relationship that God has offered. I will be to you a God, you will be to me a people if you accept. Okay? Now, again, this is not a must do it. These, again, are, we've heard Rob and others say as they teach, these are promises. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will not take my name in vain. You will not steal. You will not murder because you love me. Again, this is that relationship, covenant. All right? All right. Now something changes. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 11. Jeremiah chapter 11. I've got to find it. We have... A breach of contract. What happens with Israel? Okay. They did not incline their ear. Is that what you said? In verse 8. Okay. Well, the first 16 verses are all about this. But basically, this is God saying, all right, tried. We've got a breach of contract here. I said I would do and you would also love and cherish me. What were they doing? Remember Gomer. I don't they want to be so much like the world. Same as we are today. They want to be, they wanted a king. They're so good. Look at them. Look at them over there. They're prosperous. Look, well, how long do you want to do that? So let's take a vote. But the, the basic thing They wanted a king, but more importantly, they were whoring after other gods. Remember, the covenant was, I will be to you a god. All you have to do is love and cherish me. And I will do whatever it takes to take care of you. That was the covenant. It's pretty simple. But here you have in uh, verse 3, and say to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, cursed is the man who does not obey the words of the covenant. Same covenant, which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, obey my voice and do according to all that I command you, so shall you be my people and I will be your God. Right there it is, okay? That's the agreement. They said, nope, we like Asherah, we like Baal, we like go down the list. All right. What kind of God lets people continue in what we're talking about? What kind of God would let these people continue down the wrong road? Well, he did for a long time, but now he's a breach of contract. You don't want me? 
All right, let's see what happens. They go into captivity into Babylon, right? Lindell? I think it's interesting while, while you speak of a breach of contract, I'm really thankful that God has a very high bar for conditions for divorce. And he goes out of his way within the marriage to try to save the relationship, even when there's rebellion and a breach of contract. Just like Hosea. Yep. Yes. And that's why Ellen White points us as Seventh-day Adventists to be very familiar with two chapters in the book of Psalms, Psalms 105 and Psalms 106, because they outline, in summary, Israel's failings. And then it comes back and outlines God's eternal faithfulness. Mm -hmm. She says these are the lessons regarding the covenant relationship that we as Seventh-day Adventists should be very familiar with because it shows God's demonstration of eternal faithfulness, the covenant he made with an unfaithful people. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Yes. In, to make a contribution to the brother's question over there, he asked what kind of a God. Well, God is not slack concerning his promises, but he's long-suffering mm -hmm. to us. And uh, maybe that is why he is putting up, he has put up with, with us shouldn't only look at ancient Israel because we behave just like them in the 21st century. You are so, spot on. We do. Yeah. And we're going to get there. So God is long-suffering, but he's not slack. God is long-suffering. Remember I said at the beginning that God's intention was to put the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden. I believe Ellen White says this, and I didn't have time to pull it out, for about 6,000 years. After that, the tree would have been removed. Okay? We would have established our covenant with God. You are our God. We love you. Okay? So here we are, unfaithful people. 6,000 years later, we'll get there. Uh, let's look at Jeremiah chapter 31. Verse 31. It says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand, brought them out of the land of Egypt. Blah, blah, blah. Not blah, blah, blah. I'm sorry. I was going on to the next verse. Sorry. But this is the covenant that I will make, verse 31, that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, Jeremiah is specifically talking about a time when Israel comes back out of captivity to the promised land. Okay? So this is a, new, in other words, you forsook me, but I'm not forsaking you. Just like Hosea going after Gomer, bringing her back. Okay? We're going to have a new covenant. Same covenant. Have the conditions changed in the covenant? No, nothing's changed. It's always the same. Everlasting covenant. Okay. Now, these words are very similar to what we find in where? Hebrews. Hebrews? Hebrews. In fact, the writer of Hebrews, let's say it's Paul, I'm not sure, is quoting Jeremiah. Okay? Something else happens in between. Daniel comes on the board and he says, well, this special people, this covenant relationship here, you are on probation for 490 years. That's what God says. What happens at the end of the 490 years? Uh, I'm sorry? The remnant comes back. We have Jesus crucified. What, is, what happens to the covenant relationship then? Again, a breach of covenant. A breach of agreement. God is long-suffering. He is faithful. He does not forsake his people. So if you look, I'm gonna, we're going to run out of time. Matthew 21, 43 talks about how God says, no, you are no longer my people. And it is transferred to what? Restoring of Stephen, that mark. Okay. Changing the change over. Because God is not going to run behind them forever. Okay. So why did the writer of Hebrews, let's say Paul, quote 
Jeremiah. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 8. Let's just look at it. It's almost the same words. There's no way. <laughs> That's a mistake. <laughs> it's got to be. Hebrews chapter 8. Uh, starting around verse 7 or 8 here. Uh, verse 8. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Exact same. He's quoting Jeremiah. Why is he quoting Jeremiah? Because the same thing happened again. He's going to make another covenant with Go Hosea went after Gomer again. Well, the story doesn't go that way, but God's coming after us again because we keep rejecting him. So it's a parallel. They rejected him. They went into captivity in Babylon. He brings them back. He's still their God. They crucify his son, and he says, I will make a new covenant with you. Come on. I'm not going to give up on you. And you can find also in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 10, etc. I'm going to have to keep moving here. In Galatians chapter 3, it is called the everlasting covenant, but it's also called, and it equates the everlasting covenant is what? Also the gospel. It's the gospel message. How God will be faithful to us, he will save us. So, First covenant, old covenant, is the exact same thing as the second covenant, new covenant. Nothing has changed. All right? So when we get to Hebrews and people are talking about, oh, we're under the new covenant, they were under the old covenant, nothing has changed. I'm taking you through the history. This is a primer. It's the whole <coughs> sequence. And as we go over the rest of the quarter, we're going to be looking at these things, individual components in detail. Um, all right. So we are now, as some would say, under the new covenant. Same conditions, same promises. I will be to you a God. You will be to me a people. Just I will love and cherish you if you reciprocate. Okay? Um, so the two covenants are identical. Also called the everlasting covenant. You can see that. I'm going to skip a bunch of notes here. Nothing was changed. But what changed at the cross? I need to hit this point. Dr. Small. <clears throat> I think a big difference here is that with the other covenants, there came a time when God reviewed the performance and found the deficiencies. With this covenant, when the time comes to review my record, they're going to substitute the record of Jesus' life instead of mine. And yes. that, so... When, when that comes up, Jesus has a perfect record. My, my record is, is no longer that, there. That is the gospel. That is the plan of salvation. That is part of the everlasting covenant. What happened at the cross is, if you will, a ratification of the covenant. covenant. It was signed, irrevocable. Am I okay with that, Mr. Turner? Okay. It was ratified at the cross. Yes. You know, it's interesting. The Lord God we serve is unchangeable. That is about only one person in this whole universe is like that. We change every day. We say something. Tomorrow it's something different, something else. Yep. God does begin, not change. In the beginning. It is, That's what God has trying to tell us it is, 6,000 years. It is still unchanged. I'm going to read this statement here. It says, God is true. He changes not. We've discussed that. The condition of salvation are ever the same. Life, eternal life, is for all who obey God's law. Now to make sure it's clear, she goes on and says, Under the new covenant, the conditions by which eternal life may be gained 
are the same as the old. Perfect obedience. Okay, is that clear? Perfect obedience under the conditions are the same. It was in the old, it is in the new. I'll come right back to you. Um, so let's bring it home to today to God's remnant people. I'm going to tell you there has always been and ever will be one covenant. If you accept me, Jehovah, as your God to worship, honor, and obey, then you will be my special people forever, and I will save you. Amen. As God's remnant people today, what is our response right now? What does it need to be? Plan of salvation was decided long ago. Cindy? Said that I skipped over it. It said that in Hebrews chapter 13. Um, talks about the everlasting covenant in verse 20 and then in verse 21. To make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. So, the covenant remains the same that we are still to worship, honor, and obey. That's, that's our peace. That's our response to this love relationship. If there's anything more important than God, anything more important than this spousal relationship, I'll just say, it doesn't work. Adams chose Eve, Adam chose Eve over God. Who's more important, your spouse or God? God. God. Diet, what's more important? What you like to eat or God? Okay, now I'm stepping on toes, but I can do that because the bell's rung. What's more important, TV or God? Okay, what's more important, entertainment, movies, music, etc., or God? This is a love relationship. Nothing is supposed to come between you and God or be more important than that relationship. That is all he is asking. All right. It's not. It's that relationship, that companionship. That's what we need right now. This is that. Maybe it's too late already for some. So we must have that relationship with God or we're not going to continue. It's all about the relationship with Him. He gives His Spirit to dwell in us. His Spirit will commune with ours. We have a whole quarter to study this covenant. There's different components of it as we come down through time. This was just a primer, an overview. I hope it was helpful. You can see it's the beginning from when God decided to create man to the very end when God takes us home with him. It's the everlasting covenant. Let's have prayer. 
Father in heaven, I am so thankful that you are love, that you did not abandon us, that you keep coming after us, even though we turn our backs on you. Father, I want this morning that myself and everyone here that we will renew our relationship with you, our covenant promise with you that we will love, honor, and cherish you regardless of what happens in the world. Nothing to be more important than you in our lives. Father, we love you and we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.